Right. Here we are again with our series in Moses. We're carrying on through the story of Moses. We uh, finished off in uh, chapter 6. That's where we're going to pick up uh, again in chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 6 and we'll pick up from there. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from the yoke of slavery of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know I am the Lord your God who brought you out from the yoke of the Egyptians and I will bring you into the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Then verse 9. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and cruel bondage. So the headline, as we looked last week, was, I am the Lord. And then maybe the subplot under that was, I am the Lord, I will rescue my people. And as we carry on through this chapter, we see those are the two headlines for the people of God, that I am the Lord, and I will rescue my people. Moses has told that to the people, but what has happened? Verse 9, Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and cruel bondage. Discouragement and the situation they're in, the uh, the bondage they were under, the slavery they were held by, stopped them hearing the word of the Lord. Uh, that despondent, it says here, or discouraged, in the New King James Version says, a spirit of anguish. So God's word is coming down, it's coming to God's people, but there's a block. There's a block coming up from his people, and that block which is stopping them hearing God's word is their despondency and the, the bondage which they are in in this situation. It's a bit like going out for, for a walk and it's teeming down with rain. God's pouring rain down, but somehow we're not getting wet. The, the, the water of God's word's not coming in. It's, just, it's like ducks, how the water just is falling off a duck's back. Or another situation it might be, it'd be like a parent uh, speaking to a child and the parent saying, look, I'm with you, I'm here, we're going to get through the situation, but the child has their headphones on and they, they, they might see you there, they might have a glimpse of a word or two, but it, it's not going in. These headlines of I am the Lord and I will rescue my people are not going in. And the reason they're not going in is because of despondency, because of the situation of the slavery they're under. The slavery is too hard and their spirit is too low. You've heard messages, hopefully not just from us, but you've been get, getting content on the internet from good ministry sources. And, and, and as you hear God's word, is that what's happening to you? It's sort of bouncing off. It's, it's not saturating you. It's not encouraging you. Is, that, is it because you've got a spirit of anguish and because of this situation you find yourself in now, it's stopping God's word. Feed your souls. It can be difficult for enslaved people to hear the words of freedom. It can be difficult if you've lived from birth under the hand of an evil master, as the Israelites had. Many of Israelites would have lived it through life, the whole of life, knowing a slave master over them. It's difficult for those who've had that experience to imagine a good shepherd. Maybe the the words of, of John, Lennon, John Lennon, imagine uh, all the people, imagine if there was no heaven, uh, imagine if there was no God. Maybe that we have started to have a worldview like that as believers, even though we come to church, even though we listen to God's word, when we think about the world being shrunk down for us into just our living room, that we haven't got uh, leisure, we haven't got sport, or we haven't got pleasure, we haven't got friends to invite around, we can't get the meals we want. When life comes down and it's boiled down that actually our hope was in this world. That's what would be happening for the Israelites. They were seeing the hand of Pharaoh squashing them. That they, It's got worse, remember, since Moses turned up on the scene. And as they see things getting worse for them, that some of the joys they had in this life being taken away, 
They can't see a hope in heaven. They can't see uh, something outside of their situation, but they just want an improvement on their living situation. They just want them to, Moses to maybe, maybe appease Pharaoh. Don't liberate us. Don't, don't set us free. We don't want that. No, we just want it a little bit easier. We just want some straw for our brick so we can enjoy our work. And, and maybe uh, we can eat our food and, and, and live in our, in our days in Egypt with a bit of pleasure from our slave master. God wants so much more for his people than we want for ourselves. We will settle for so much smaller piecemeal than what he has for us. Here, God wants the total liberation of his people out from the hand of Pharaoh. Yet God's people are thinking, no, let's just, let's just get a, a slightly better terms from Pharaoh. So, the headline, I am the Lord, I will rescue my people, has come up with this objection from God's people. and it's, The word's not saturating their souls. Another objection is, is Moses in, in chapter 12. So I'll read down from verse 10 to, chapter, to verse 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his country. But Moses said to the Lord, If the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me, since I am speaking with faltering lips? That can feel a, bit, a little bit like uh, us on the doors before we go out. If the people at church won't listen to us, why would the people on the doors listen to us? And here, here is Moses sort of saying that, well, the people of God, I, I've told them the things you've told me to tell them, and it hasn't been received. How will I go to the world and tell the world? It's not going to receive it. It's unbelief on Moses' part, isn't it? Imagine Moses... There he is, he's had a, a princely upbringing, yet he's a Hebrew. He recognises the plight of his people and wants to do something to help them. He flees after he, the accidental, it seems accidental, murderer trying to uh, help an Israelite and he murders an Egyptian. And he flees to Midian where he's a shepherd for a good number of years. And then one day he sees this strange sight of, of a bush burning, but yet it's not consumed. And he, he draws near it and the Lord says, take off your sandals for you're on holy ground. And, and he speaks with an audible voice to him and tells him that he's going to set his people free. And Moses is the man to go to Pharaoh and tell them to set them free. He gives him the miracles of a hand that goes leprous and, and not leprous, uh, a staff that becomes a snake and goes back to a staff. And then he sends him out with Aaron to help him. And yet here we have Moses again saying, I can't do it. I can't do it. Uh, I, I, I can't do it. I, I can't speak. I can't go to Pharaoh. Uh, uh, God's people haven't even heeded my words. And, and now how's Pharaoh going to listen to, to what I say? Here is Moses in unbelief, even though he himself has received special revelation from the hand of God, hasn't he? Yet, does he believe that God is going to do this? It's an objection from Moses. It's an objection from God's people. Shows us that uh, our leaders, our spiritual leaders, are just as frail uh, as God's people. We're, we're in desperate need. All of us are in desperate need for, for to hear God's voice and to believe, to place our faith and our trust in it. Today is an opportunity to put our faith into action. Every day is that opportunity, but it's been a bit heightened in the season we're in now. Are you allowing God's word to penetrate your heart? And are you seeking to act out with faith? Well, the headline again, I am the Lord, I will rescue my people. God's people haven't heeded it. Moses is not believing it. Then the third objection is, jumped into verse 30. So there's a section where the record of the, of the families that are, are there are given and numbers. We're not going to read through those, but we're going to skip down to verse 28. Now, when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. But Moses said to the Lord, since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? 
So his objection was, uh, earlier was one of unbelief, that how would Pharaoh listen? And his next objection is a focus on himself. My lips, I speak with faltering lips, or another uh, version says it's uncircumcised lips. And by uncircumcised, we mean not set apart. You know, God is set apart as holy. But Moses here is saying, look, I'm just a man. I'm, I'm not set apart for this. This focus on himself is what we're all prone to do, isn't it? He's saying, we're saying there's a big problem. It's a big problem. Egypt is over us. Pharaoh is oppressing us. We're in captivity. But my lips, God wants to rescue us. He wants to redeem us. He wants to take us out of our situation of slavery. That's what the Israelites were under. But Moses is worried about his, his lips. There's something wrong with the words that might come out, that he doesn't have the power to, to overthrow Pharaoh. And therefore, we see Moses himself being despondent. As God's people were despondent, here Moses is despondent. But we should never be focusing on ourselves. Our faith is not about ourselves. It's not what's uh, always going on in our hearts and what, how we feel. It's not always what's going on in our minds and what we think. It's not always about our emotions. No, our faith is about Christ. It's about Jesus. It's about God. That's the centre of it. That's what holds it and keeps it. It's him. So there is a bigger picture. Moses is missing the bigger picture. The big picture is not about what comes out of his mouth and how Pharaoh responds to Moses, but the bigger picture is about God's voice speaking through Moses and how Pharaoh responds to God. And this bigger picture is painted in chapter 7, verse 1 to 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. There is a bigger picture. God's purposes are being worked out in this situation. Yes, Pharaoh will not initially listen to Moses, but there's a purpose in that, that God is working out the salvation of his people, but also he's revealing his glory that all Egypt will know that he is the Lord. We can't all interpret our days well. We, we see dimly, don't we? And we, uh, we can have a glimpse of what God is doing. And, but behind it, God is working out the salvation of his people and that his name would be honoured and glorified. That will happen. That will come about. The people wanted better living conditions. Is that become your gospel? Is your gospel become the uh, release of this virus, the end of lockdown, so that you might be able to once gather again as a church, or that you might be able to gather with your, your son or your daughter you've not seen, or have over friends which you haven't had, or to be able to breeze around the supermarket and it not be an intense situation? Has that become your salvation? Has that become what you'd long and desire for? Is that what your prayer life is about? Well, this story of the Egyptians' uh, hand of slavery on and the Israelites' freedom reveals to us there's a bigger dimension. For the Israelites, they can be tempted to just want uh, a better situation, but God wants more. He wants the total liberation of his people and his name glorified in the earth. Moses wants to quit. God's people just want it a little bit better. Yet the headline again is, I am the Lord and I will rescue my people. 
Do you believe the headlines? Well, the newspapers we attempted and we shouldn't really be believing all that is printed. We know that. But are we believing all that is printed in his word, which is reliable, which is trustworthy? Jesus is the Lord and he will rescue his people. He's coming for you. He's going to redeem you. He's going to take you to glory. So what are the applications then as we look into how God liberated Israel out of the hand of Egypt? What applications can we have for ourselves? Two applications. Like last week, we need to remember our real enemy. Jesus said, whoever sins is a slave to sin. Our real enemy is sin that leads to death. Our real enemy is Satan, who wants to stop us hearing the word of God. Remember he said about last week, Pharaoh wanted to stop God's people hearing God's word? And the tactic worked. The spirit that they came under them, as they felt these additional pressures, stopped them receiving God's word. This situation exposes our sin. I read uh, online about people, uh, this uh, past week was all about people with pastors working out, how do I uh, stream uh, my content? How do I stream a Sunday service? How do I work uh, out an online ministry? Uh, One pastor said, that was the conversation this week. In two weeks' time, it will be, how do I provide marriage counselling online? As, as relationships are intensified, aren't they? As we, I don't know if you've had an increase in, in arguments in your home. If you're living alone, it might be more difficult. Uh, but there's an intensity of relationships. This season is going to expose us. It'll expose our sin as we have more tension in our homes. It'll expose our sin as we're not getting the things that we wish we could get our hands on. Sin is the real problem, not the lockdown and not a virus. No, the virus is, is deadly for some, isn't it? But sin, that virus, is deadly for all. We're all exposed to it. We're all contaminated by it. And it's all going to lead to our demise, our spiritual death and our physical death. Also, our sin is exposed as, are you obeying the authorities? You know, we've been told, haven't we, to you know, only go out for exercise and food and essentials, yet we've seen that the police have had to knock over people's barbecues and stop them from gathering. It exposes us, doesn't it, this season? Also, what we're we meant to be doing? We're meant to be prioritising the vulnerable and the weak, aren't we, in our society? Staying at home to save lives. All these things are only going to expose what's going on inside us. As a society, are we loving God, as a society, are we obeying our authorities? Well, time will tell how this works out, and as time goes on, it may well get harder. But the point that I want to apply is that our real enemy is not our living conditions today, but is still sin. And these words of the Lord that he spoke here through Moses, the prophet, I am the Lord, I will rescue my people, reverberate in Jesus' mouth as he enters and says in the, into the human history, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor and the release for the captive, to release the oppressed. That's a reverberation of what God is saying here. I am the Lord, I will rescue my people. Jesus now says, I am the Lord, I will rescue my people. Yet Jesus' eyes are not on the Egyptians and releasing them from the hand of Pharaoh. Jesus' eyes is not even on the Roman occupation, which is currently in Israel as he speaks those words. No, his eye is on Satan, on sin and death, which has got a hold of God's people. That's the enemy he's targeting. That's the freedom he is seeking for his people. Jesus is after the defeat of a tyrant. Moses wanted to defeat Pharaoh. Jesus wants to defeat Satan. But history tells us when you remove a tyrant and just leave a vacuum, what happens? Well, chaos happens. We've seen that recently, sadly, haven't we? In Iraq uh, and in Libya and these places where you you remove a tyrant if you don't install another government, then you know, chaos reigns. 
Do we just want the release of this tyrant of sin and death and evil in the world? We want Satan got rid of. But Jesus does that and installs himself as the kind king in its place. So our application is to remember, are you your eyes on the real enemy, which is sin, Satan, the flesh and the world? As we're reminded that the real, that's the real enemy, the second application is that we need Jesus. Objections came, didn't they? I'm the Lord, I'll rescue my people. But objections came up from God's people. Obje- objections came up from Moses. You might see your real enemy and you might hear the word of the Lord, but do objections rise in you? I want this. I'd rather have life like that. Well, Jesus comes along and he removes our burdens. Uh, The burden of slavery is going to be taken off the back of the Israelites. That's a picture of Jesus comes and he removes our burdens and he bears them at the cross. The sin which uh, which consumes our hearts and our lives and makes us distant from God, that Jesus comes to bring reconciliation between man and God. Imagine if the Israelites were to just to appoint Moses as their king. It wouldn't work, would it? Pharaoh would still be above Moses. Jesus doesn't just come to install himself above, uh, in between the world's powers and you. No, he comes to remove these powers of sin and darkness and in place himself as your king. We need to hear his voice. As we hear the voice of Jesus, that sweet voice, voice. He removes our burdens. He turns our anguish into joy. He turns our despondency into praise. And he reveals his glory. Chapter 7, verse 5. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. The Lord is going to sweep into history and deal with all his enemies. He's going to sweep in, he's going to reveal who he is, that all might see who he is. He's going to deal with all these enemies, wipe them away, and he's going to reveal his glory and everyone will know that Jesus Christ is Lord. We need Jesus because he's coming to defeat his enemies. So you're either with the people of God in Christ, with Jesus as your king, or you're outside and you're facing defeat. You're facing a coming judgment. We might feel like today feels like a time of judgment on the world, but it's not in comparison to that great and awful day of the Lord when he'll come and wipe out his enemies. There is a fearful fate prepared, the Bible tells us, for Satan and his demons. We don't want his lot. We don't want to be under that judgment. So what do we need to do? Well, we need Jesus. We need to cling to Christ. We need to reject this bellow today that we might, our hearts might crave after and just seek Jesus today. That we would know the forgiveness of his of our sins, that we would know that smile from heaven. It's Jesus says, I am the Lord and I will rescue my people. If those words of, of God, he says that I am the Lord and I will rescue you, if those words are no comfort to you, if all you can think of is getting a full Tesco shop or having your friends over or you know, being able to walk outside the house as many times as you like, or not have a pervading fear of your own mortality or a reminder of your mortality on the news. If that is still stopping you, know some comfort when Jesus says, I will rescue you. Then are you still in Egypt? Are you still with the Israelites under Satan and looking for bedded conditions from your slave master? 
we, God's people, can be full of praise despite our circumstances because Jesus defeated the greatest enemy. Jesus has overcome the grave. He's liberated the sons of God from the fear of death. Yes, it's right as humans to be aware and know that death is an enemy and have a sense of fear, but Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And he's conquered the grave. Yes, it's fearful, but he's dealt with it. And he's rescued you from what causes it. And he is the first fruits of the resurrection. And he's going to come for his people. As he was coming to the rescue of the Israelites, so he is coming to your rescue. Jesus says to you, I am the Lord and I will rescue you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we look at this world around us. We recognise that there is pain and suffering and trouble. And Lord, we recognise there is a fearful day, a day of judgement where we're going to be before you. And the the great question is not did we love our neighbour, not did we obey your law, but what did we do with your son? Do we, do we know Jesus? Has he forgiven us our sins? Has he made us right with God? Or have we rejected him and gone our own way, and sought our own lot, sought to save ourselves, however that might have worked out? And Father, we come before you crying out for mercy. Lord, have mercy on all of the congregation of Hope Church Ferndown. We pray that in this season of the, any who don't belong to you, that they would come and cling to Christ. And Lord, we pray for our community that as, uh, as the nation is sh- shaken and the nations are shaken, Lord, that there will be many who come to Christ, many who put their trust in him. So Lord, we thank you that we can sing songs of praise despite our circumstances, because you have gr- defeated the greatest enemy of sin and death, that you have risen from the grave. And we Thank you that you can place a peace and a joy inside our hearts despite our circumstances and we can cry out with the children of God, Abba Father and holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the rescuer and the redeemer of our souls. Thank you that you love us with a love that changes us and transforms us. Thank you for your redemptive work that frees us from the hand of Satan and places us in the liberation of the children of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.